AI is a powerful tool, but it's critical that we design AI systems at what I term the user, the community, and the society level. And if we design even just at the community level beyond our direct user population, I believe we'll create AI systems that are likely to have a positive societal impact. I've been working on defining this new model for AI design for the last year, and today I hope to make these ideas clear as I speak for the need for a more human-centered view of artificial intelligence. So, as you all know, AI is taking the world by storm in many areas. From scientific discovery with things like AlphaFold that was created by DeepMind, a, um, a, a subsidiary of Google that is letting us unfold the protein and will have major impact on medicine, to natural language processing which allows very usable speech recognition and language translation, which I'm sure many of you use uh, traveling around the world or communicating with people in other languages, that now works quite well, to even AI-driven fashion design, where design houses are using AI to predict what styles will be coming up in the next season and making sure that they're planning properly and ordering the right supply chain materials so that they don't waste. But generative AI is what has taken the public by storm most recently. So things like ChatGPT to answer your questions, or Midjourney or DALI to generate images based on your text prompt, and Copilot for helping you code better or make better PowerPoint slides. So this is the future of AI. And here's our first quiz question. <laughs> How many people have tried and played with ChatGPT at this point? Okay, so a good percentage of you in the room. I actually think that's what's really interesting about what's occurred in AI over the last year. There has been improvements in the technology over the last year, but what's really big is that it's been come in a way that's accessible to the public to play with it themselves and actually understand what has been happening in the deep learning revolution, which has been driving these advances in AI for over 10 years. So, these kind of tools and things that will be built similarly to them on top of deep learning are the future of AI, but I would say that AI has been in our lives for several years, just we are less aware of it. For example, the most common place we see artificial intelligence making impact today is in manipulating our social network feeds, causing people to feel bad. We've seen this in research with respect to especially young women with Instagram or even worse, to be deceived and outraged about what's true or not, even upending democracies all over the world. We've seen AI helping judges to set bail or sentencing for suspected criminals in a way that is, in a way that is biased by race, as has been shown in studies of the COMPASS program here in the United States. And because of these different misuses of AI, we founded this institute at Stanford, Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, almost five years ago, with anticipation of that a lot of these types of problems would be occurring in the future. And we wanted to really help guide us to a better future because we think there's a lot of positive uses that we're gonna see of AI and we wanna make sure that we're having more of the positive than the negative. So we founded the institute with three guiding principles. First, we believe AI should be guided by a concern for its impact on human society. This technology is too potent to consider its effects after the fact, compelling us to explore its ethical implications before, during, and after its development. We can't just wait till afterwards and say, oh, whoops, that was a problem, and try to fix it later. Next, we believe that AI should be inspired by human intelligence. The human brain remains the single most sophisticated device in the known universe, and we should strive to learn all we can from its nature. So the advances that you're seeing in AI today based on this model of deep learning, which is inspired by the human brain, many of us believe is powerful and has gotten us very far, but it's not the end all to artificial intelligence. And so we believe as a research institution, we should be looking at ways to look into what other ways are gonna push this forward. And so we wanna be inspired by the human brain through collaborations with neuroscience, as well as cognitive and social sciences in terms of how people behave to potentially lead to new algorithms that are better in other ways. And then finally, AI should augment, not replace human capabilities. 
So it's inevitable that AI will reshape significant swaths of the global workforce, and we should be pr prepared for that upheaval in coming generations. Just like economists were aware of the upheaval that would be caused by globalization, they're also aware of the potential upheaval caused by AI, and we should make sure that our government representatives are paying attention to make sure this does not lead to an instance of haves and haves nots. But we also believe with the proper guidance that AI can enhance the qualities that make us human, and we can guide the types of AI systems and applications that are built in ways that are gonna be beneficial to humans and beneficial to human labor rather than simply replace them. Now, because of these negative social impacts, we've actually seen a proliferation of AI for good initiatives and institutes. You might even think of HAI as one such institute. Though there are two main ways that I've seen most of these other efforts going. The first type of initiative is often made up of social scientists who notice and critique the potential or real harms of AI, and that's useful, but that doesn't help us apply AI in positive ways. It might avoid some of the problems after the fact, but we'd really like to get to these warnings earlier. Um, so how do we proactively design to avoid the issues and harms that AI systems might introduce? The second type of effort, which is both more common and often fails, is when technologists try to go it alone. So typically, AI experts see an important social impact area like health or education and apply AI naively so that it doesn't work in practice. This has happened repeatedly, but has occurred acutely in sh more short-term crises like the current COVID crisis that we're still in. Many people applied AI systems and tried to make an impact and most of these efforts failed. It's also occurred repeatedly over the long term in the field of AI. So for example, in 2016, about seven years ago, Turing Award winner Jeff Hinton said we should stop training radiologists now as AI will easily surpass humans within five years. Jeff Hinton won the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize in computer science, for being one of the you know, inventors, let us say, or at least he pushed harder than a lot of people on deep learning, which is the key technology that is driving all of the applications that you're seeing out there today. So this prediction hasn't worked out, and it's a good thing uh, we didn't listen because radiologists are still in short supply. It's not worked out in AI and radiology. It's not worked out in AI and skin cancer detection, and not in AI in several areas, other areas. This is often due to differences between the ideal data sets on which researchers train and test their algorithms and the messiness of the data found in real world hospitals and clinics. That's not to say eventually these algorithms won't get better and better as those problems are worked out. I believe they will. But I think even worse is this prediction points out a mistake that is often made by these technical researchers, which is they're not even solving the right problem. So what do I mean by that? Instead of trying to replace radiologists, we might want to have AI systems working in tandem with the radiologist to make the technology more useful. So augment the radiologist's capabilities rather than replace them. So as my Stanford radiology and AI colleague, Kurt Langholz writes in one of his papers, which got a lot of publicity in the New York Times, he wrote, Will AI replace radiologists is the wrong question. Instead, he wrote, the right answer is radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. And I think you could take that templated sentence there and replace radiologists with many other occupations and it would be true. Now, I would say part of the problem of where we're at today is we don't know how to design AI systems and applications to have positive human impacts. And so I believe there's a better way to design uh, for positive human impact, and that's what I want to introduce you to today. So the better way is what I term human-centered AI. So how do we get positive outcomes from AI? That is, what would it have taken to avoid the negative outcomes from, for example, the Compass AI-assisted sentencing system? So to avoid these outcomes, 
We need to design and analyze these systems at three levels in conjunction, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the user, the community, and society. And I believe that if we do so, we'll create technology that has a better chance of making a positive impact. So let me unpack that further. What do I mean by human-centered AI and these levels of analysis? So first, human-centered AI is about the scope of who we study, who we study to find our problems, develop our solutions, and evaluate whether the systems and applications we've designed and built work as intended. And so to do this, we first have to have what I would term a user-centered process. That is to integrate well-known techniques from human-computer interaction and design that account for the needs and abilities of end users of computing systems early and often and rapidly iterate and improve a design through rigorous testing. This is not a new concept. This is something that's taken you know, about 30 years to go from accepted practice in the research fields in these areas for pretty much every company today that produces software going through a user-centered process. It took 30 or 40 years to convince engineers that they are not the typical user and just testing it with themselves was not sufficient to see if software was gonna work, okay? This will help us develop AI systems that work for humans rather than futilely trying to replicate humans. But I claim this is not enough. As been illustrated by some of these harmful examples I introduced earlier, we can't only design around the user. So that would be like designing that sentencing system just for the judge, creating a nice user interface so that the judge could understand the data, but that would ignore some of the underlying systemic issues that had more to do with the problems with that Compass system. So it would ignore that the community that the system is gonna impact. So the people who are accused, their families, the, their lawyers, if it's a crime of the victim, that person, their families, and their communities. And we might need to understand the different issues that those communities face, structural barriers they face, for example, racism, before we could appropriately design that system. What's interesting, as we analyze that broader set of folks, we might instead learn that the users of that system might be broader than just the judge. It might involve some of these other people in those larger communities, and they should be included at that user-centered level of design. I would claim that's not enough. We also need to understand what the impacts are on society at large. So in this example, what does it mean to have a large percentage of African-American males in prison in the United States, or a large percentage of people who are caught using illegal drugs? I'm not saying those things are easily solved, but these are issues that have immense societal costs. And so when we're building these types of systems, like a system that's intended to be ubiquitous across society, like this sentencing system was di desired to be, we want to try to forecast what might happen if that software becomes ubiquitous and design to mediate potential societal impacts. So I don't want to leave you with the idea that that's easy. In fact, it's very hard. But it's especially hard for computer scientists who are not trained at all to ask these kind of questions and to analyze it. That's why for these type of systems, we truly need to have interdisciplinary teams. So not only technologists and AI experts, but also experts from design, experts from the social sciences and humanities, and domain expertise depending on the area. So it might be experts in fields such as medicine, law, or environmental science. And these experts need to be true partners on AI projects from the start, rather than simply add it at the end to investigate possible harms. This is another reason I actually think that Stanford is very well positioned to be leading the way in how to explore these areas because of the great interdisciplinary nature of the schools that we have here at Stanford. This is something that's hard to replicate at, let's say, an engineering school like MIT that does not have a school of law, a school of medicine, and, and, and true humanities. So let me run you through an example of what this type of analysis might look like for something you may have seen out there in the popular press, autonomous cars. So here's a Tesla. How many people here uh, drive a Tesla? How many, okay. How many people have been in a Tesla? Okay, so a lot of people. Really depends where I give this talk. I gave it in Cambridge a couple months ago, and out of the 40 people in the room, only two people owned cars, so it was kind of hard to tell that, <laughs> tell that the story was a little tougher, but they got it. 
Okay. So the Tesla has this autopilot feature or full self-driving. Um, now, whether you think it's already here, autonomous cars, or whether it's going to happen in 10 years, I believe they are going to happen. It's just a question of what is your definition of autonomy? Does it mean it can drive itself in every condition, in every place, or is it in more limited weather or limited locations where it's been mapped? You know, and so you know, Elon Musk will say it's already been here, and maybe Toyota and Ford will say it's 15 years, and some people will say never because there's issues. But I think in general we will see autonomy. But I'll claim that most of the research done on this, and note there is a lot of research done on this, although you might have only started hearing about this 10 years ago as companies started to do it, there's been research on autonomous cars going back to the 70s. In fact, Stanford uh, built one of the first autonomous vehicles in the 70s. When I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon in the early 90s, there was a big truck that drove through um, Shenley Park right next to the campus in Pittsburgh. It went only about eight or 10 miles per hour, and it was a big truck because it had a lot of big computers in the back and probably power and other things to do it, but that was an autonomous car. So this research is not new. It's been going on 50 or 60 years. But I'll claim that most of the focus of all of that time is at this user-centered level, the driver in this case. So what does the driver see, for example, when in autopilot mode in a Tesla? This is one of the views that you could see behind the steering wheel. So what should it show and how should it get the attention of the driver, let's say, when the system becomes less sure about how good its inferences are due to weather or lack of recent maps or due to other cars? That's really all at the driver level. But there's other levels of analysis that are quite important to solving or even posing this problem correctly. At the community level, we care about other drivers out there and what is their behavior, whether in autonomous cars or not in autonomous cars. We care about studying interactions with pedestrians and bicyclists. And I would say these have all been an afterthought for these efforts and have led to many of the problems that might have been avoided if they had been considered much earlier on in this conception of autonomous driving. So any, are there any people here, Bay Area folks, okay? So if you're in the Bay Area, we've been seeing autonomous test cars driving around for years. You know, they're on my street all the time over here on the Stanford campus. And one thing they, couldn't, they didn't anticipate by not doing this type of analysis is that people in non-autonomous cars drive differently when they're around an autonomous car than when they're not, okay? And that's then how to change their algorithms because, you know, you see that autonomous car and you're like, okay, I might be careful. I don't know how many of you have seen some of these autonomous taxis in San Francisco with no one in it, and then you really are like, okay, I'm staying away, okay? <laughs> but I would say even more important, at the society level, we need to consider the impacts of autonomous cars on a city or a region. Maybe the impacts are not as positive as the enthusiasts might lead you to believe. So some studies have shown that autonomous cars will lead to more traffic and potentially more deaths due to driving more miles, living further away, and sending cars around empty. So let me impact that a little. So for example, I live on the Stanford campus. I like that because I ride my bike to work. But let's say my wife and I are gonna go see a show in San Francisco. We might drive up there, but I don't wanna pay somebody 50 or 60 bucks to park my car. I have my autonomous car. I might send it down to South San Francisco, or I might send it all the way here to Stanford to keep it safe. Right? I've just doubled the miles on that. Or maybe I think paying $3 million to live on the Stanford campus is a bit much, and I might instead go live in the Central Valley and spend two hours in my autonomous car every morning sleeping while it drives me into work or likely doing PowerPoint slides because that's what we faculty really do all the time. <laughs> okay? Again, you see how the miles driven are going to change based on the capabilities of autonomy that people are going to receive from these cars. Now, these aren't just newspaper headlines, but are based on research. For example, by transportation experts at the University of Texas, who published this paper, who found, at least in the Texas Triangle mega region, which I always have to think about, I'm like, it's a triangle, but it's Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. Any Texans here? Okay, we got some of you. So two of those are on one of those lines. Okay, that's the Texas Triangle mega region. 
they show through their simulations of transportation uh, systems that autonomous cars there would likely swamp traffic due to the changes that these AI cars, uh, AI based cars will bring without significant changes to the transportation system. Okay, so I'm not arguing that autonomous cars are bad. There's actually a lot of uh, good reason. Many of us in this room, you see my gray beard, are getting up there in age and maybe having a car that I didn't have to drive that could take care of it would be great. My mother uh, is 96 and lives in the house I grew up in. Um, luckily, she's still not driving at this point, but an autonomous car would be very empowering for her to get around to places she wants to go without uh, relying on others. So it's, I'm not saying this is bad, but what I am saying is from this, if we did this type of analysis from the start, we might decide that our societal resources might be better spent on, for example, building a better public transit system. Most of us travel to Europe and we come back and go, why can't we have that, um, right? But if we only analyze and design at that user-centered level at the start, we may ignore these important questions until it's too late. And I think these are questions of power. So who has the power to choose what we do with our societal resources? And I would say right now, if we think about AI, that power is actually concentrated in a few large companies that have the resources to build these large models that you may have read about called large language models, or here at Stanford, we call them foundation models, because these large models are the foundation upon which a lot of other applications and models are gonna be built. And right now, only a few large companies and governments have the resources to build these models that are now going up to the generation that is coming out, hundreds of millions of dollars to build them, the next generation maybe a billion dollars to build the model. So we're talking about a lot of money. And there's a lot of decisions that are getting made that the public so far hasn't had a lot of say in. So you might think about that. Now, I've given you an idea of what human-centered AI is and the simple analysis of autonomous cars. But I want to actually use the same lens to criticize one of my own research projects. So, you know, I'm not going to say I'm all clean here and show you where it's human-centered, but where this analysis shows we could have done better and we are trying to do better now that we've thought about it in this new way. So the motivation for our hybrid physical digital spaces project is that many Americans are overstressed, inactive, wasteful, uninspired, and feeling isolated. Not everybody, but many. And this often occurs in their work or in their schools. And we were surprised to observe that most people spend almost all their time inside the built environment with these afflictions. So 87% of our time in the built environment, homes and offices, according to the US EPA. So we started out wanting to understand how features of that built environment, such as materials, access to natural light or nature, as well as the user experience, so the noise or dynamic digital displays on the walls would impact people's well-being. And we've run some experiments showing these connections between these variables, but I wanna show you how the vision of what we might use this information for to change behavior and wellness in the future. So there's a growing awareness that our time spent in buildings can negatively impact our wellness. But we were surprised when we started this research project out was that the science behind the awareness and the recommended strategies to improve the situation are quite thin. I thought architects and civil engineers would have done the studies and then I started to work with architects and civil engineers on this project and said, no, nobody's done these studies. Um, they haven't. We were interested in learning how can we build up a science to understand how buildings affect people and then how can we redesign, redesign spaces to account for these understandings? And then how do we design systems that can sense our afflictions and dynamically adjust the space to improve our health and wellness? And this actually started out when one of my colleagues in civil and environmental engineering, Sarah Billington, approached me after she had a faculty meeting in the faculty club in a very poorly designed room where she said she left the meeting just feeling horrible and it didn't have to do with the content of the meeting it was really about how the space made her feel and it reminded me of the office I had in grad school which was a windowless office with the walls made out of cinder block but that building won, won an award from the concrete uh, concrete contractors of America I remember the 
I remember the plaque there at Carnegie Mellon, Ween Hall. Didn't feel well there. So we started to really look into this in a more scientific manner. So what would be the vision of an office of the future that we could build? And so we started by making a vision video with undergrads here at Stanford trying to imagine this office of the future. So maybe we wanna be able to detect the stress of a worker and adapt their space to have more natural scenery or lower the lights and change the music to lower their stress. And for me as a designer, it's like, how do you do that in a non-creepy way, okay? You know, I can't just start playing cool jazz and all my grad students are like, James is stressed out again, okay? <laughs> or maybe we have a dynamic ambient mural on the walls in the hallways, okay? Or on your personal devices. So imagine this wall where these pedals are blowing in the wind down that direction. And I'm walking down the hallway, I might be encouraged to follow it in that direction because I want to see what's going on. Where are those pedals going? And what do you know? That just happens to be the way of the stairs and the elevators that way. So maybe I get more exercise and I don't use energy moving around the building. Or maybe over there is this new person who's joined, my, joined the larger work group who I haven't met yet. So I might run into them and, and introduce myself. Right? There's many way, things we might want to do to change the behavior. So that's a vision of the future where buildings and people interact in a way that positively shapes our well-being. But I'll admit it's a very techno-optimist future. But how would we even get to that future? I'd say there's this nascent well-building movement, um, but all the studies behind that so far are relatively small-scale, short-term, and based on self-report. So we've taken a more integrated and scientific approach. And our first step in this project was to try to assess, well, try to establish the science and understand how these different building attributes impact occupant states and wellness and eventually in more naturalistic settings. And then eventually we want to design adaptations that can include these dy dynamic ones that I've shown you possible ones to support well-being. And then eventually we want to deploy these technologies, but before we design and deploy them, we want to understand what types of sensing and data collection people are willing to work with and which they prefer not to have. So think about things like privacy. So I'm going to discuss these issues in turn. So after some preliminary online experiments, we ran a year-long controlled lab experiment on campus here with over 400 people. And in this experiment, we systematically varied building features such as natural or artificial materials. So think natural wood like this for the furniture versus that kind of white laminate furniture, natural or artificial light. We literally, if you look in these images, we had these two offices. We paid to build a wall across the windows in one of those offices. Luckily, they'll take it down eventually. Um, and we vary the images on the walls to depict diverse versus non-diverse individuals. So in one set of images, it was a bunch of white men. These were all from Stanford archive of images, so we were able to use these. A bunch of white men in the three images, and then another one had diverse individuals um, by race and gender. So we did all eight conditions varying those variables. And we had participants wear something called an Empatica watch, as well as an Apple watch. Now what's interesting about the Empatica armband is it can sense electrodermal activity, so think kind of like sweat, and we can measure people's stress. And we also use standard surveys where we had people self-report stress, their sense of belonging, a creativity task, and an environmental task as well. Now to do this experiment, because it's not a naturalistic setting, we have people coming into the lab only for an hour, we actually have to stress them out to see what the impact is. So the way we stress people out is in the middle of this, we tell them, oh, you're going to have to give a talk in two minutes on your positive and negative personality characteristics. This really stresses people out. And trust us, we, we tested several different things to do this. OK, so I'm just going to show you the biggest results here. If you are super interested, there's this journal article um, that one of our graduate students um, led the writing of that got published last year. Um, but the condition with the natural materials helped de de decrease the stress the most, which was a surprise to me. I would have thought the light was. And the light, natural light actually did, but not as big. So here you see the self-reported stress, lower being better, and the green one is the natural wood materials in the office. That was the only difference in the office when we look at the data in this way. And then similarly, if we look at the data from the Empatica armband, 
we can see the stress levels never got up to as high a peak and they recover more quickly, okay? Same thing though for people exposed to natural light through the windows, just not as big a result. There's other results for uh, increased divergent creativity and environmental behavior and things like this, but again, none had as big an effect as this. Now we really wanna run these kind of experiments not just in the lab for an hour, and in fact, we have a pilot study going on right now with four people in each of those two offices for weeks at a time where we're varying these to see how well it works, and then eventually we wanna do it in real office spaces. But to do that, we need more sophisticated methods to measure the outcomes. We can't have people filling out forms and surveys all the time. So we wanna uh, improve five different outcomes. You can see here, stress, belonging, creativity, physical activity, and environmental behavior. And we were intentional not to explore productivity as it's been, that's the one variable that has been explored a little more. And it, also introduces serious concerns of management misuse. So think about Amazon warehouse workers who are fired if they not, don't pack enough boxes um, quickly enough. So how do we do this? So we use AI to take the data from these different sensors and try to figure out what's happening. Now we actually start with self-report like we did in our other study and a lot of the previous work, but instead of filling out long forms, we send people to their phone or their watch like one question that says something like, How, what's your stress level right now on a scale of one to 10? And they can answer that very quickly, but you might see that question three or four times a day. And this is called the experience sampling method. So you ask short survey questions periodically. We can also use those building sensors that have been put into a lot of buildings for sustainability and security purposes that lets us know, for example, how many people are in a room, the energy use, how much uh, recycling has occurred. And then finally, we get much of our data by leveraging the personal sensors that people carry every day, like your phone and watches and other kinds of exercise bands. Or in fact, I have a ring you know, or a ring, all of these kind of devices, we can get this type of data as well. Now, these are sophisticated sensing devices and they let us get at physical activity and stress through physiological sensing. But because that type of data is highly personal and sensitive, it's really important for us to include both non-technical and technical approaches to privacy and security. So in this project, we make sure to use mixed methods where we try to understand people's comfort level, Collecting this type of data, we make sure the studies are opt-in, so you have to be careful that you're not doing sensing of anyone who walks in a building who chose not um, to be part of it. And then finally, you have to secure the data and restrict the analysis on a need-to-know basis. But my claim is, in my own project, we were carrying out what I think is mainly user-centered design at this bottom level. There might be a tiny bit of community-centered design, let's say that idea about opt-in, but something was really missing. So how could we get at the community-centered and society-centered issues? Now I'm gonna show you some of our newer research that tries to better understand things at these higher levels so you can see that you know, we learned ourselves from this. So this uneasiness with some of the privacy implications at the community and society level led us to develop and run several design workshops. So these design workshops have helped us to do more of this community-based analysis that the project has been missing. And we've had workshop participants pose benefits and risks and work through value trade-offs as well as su suggest potential interventions. So we've now run this version of this workshop with over 110 participants across eight different iterations as we worked on the techniques. And I'm gonna show you some of what it looks like just to give you an idea of what we're doing. So one of the issues in these smart spaces like a smart building is how do you communicate to individual users and community about what's happening in the smart space or even in your own home? What data is being tracked and how is it being used? So a big part of our workshop was focused on how do we communicate these issues to people who use our hybrid digital, uh, hybrid digital physical, physical digital spaces. So one way products communicate these issues today is using privacy policies. But these policies are essentially useless. So at left there is an art piece where the artist has printed out the real privacy policies that you use every day on really common products on the internet. 
Nobody reads them. How many of you read the privacy policies of you know, Instagram or Facebook or any of these things? Anybody here? Okay, I, I would claim there's always one or two of you in the room, okay? But these policies are purely a legal construct, right? They're there to protect the companies that write them from lawsuits. They aren't meant to actually communicate to you what's really going on with the product. And so instead we were looking for another way to communicate what's going on in the building. So now what I'm gonna show you is two art pieces that we didn't create but inspired some of what we are doing. So we've been developing this idea of implication design. This is where we try to embed a product's ethical implications directly into its design. So for example, this eye cam here is a webcam shaped like a creepy human eye. You really know it's watching you, and that's a form of communication. Uh, you know what's going on, it's not ambiguous. I'd say maybe it's a little over the top, but you know what's happening. There's some examples of this in the market today. For example, many of your phones, you'll see a little red dot, a little green dot or a different color depending on the device when it's recording you. It's a little maybe too subtle at times. Um, but most of these interventions also don't quite communicate the extent of the threat. Here's another artistic piece. This is called the parasite. You put this on top of your smart speaker and then it only unlocks when you give the keyword that you've defined. And so now you're assured that Google, Amazon, Apple, or Baidu are not listening into your conversation. So it protects you and it also communicates to you because you see it on there and know it's like protecting you. And so we want to combine both these ideas of communication and protection and what we call implication design. So we've created this uh, pretty much all day workshop, though we've also offered it in multi days for a shorter number of hours. And the key idea is that the participants are diverse in terms of their domain knowledge. So we have technologists, designers, domain specific experts, but also diverse in terms of their lived experience. Um, so in the single day workshop, it's meant to be lightweight and it's meant to allow everyone to participate, not just the experts. And it has three key rounds that are structured by using a deck of cards that the participants create as they participate in the workshop. So in the anticipation round, they fill out the deck of cards speculating on the hypothetical situations, including who are the impacted users, as well as positive and negative implications. And you gotta have both positive, because if you just focus on the negative, you won't design anything. You need to think about what these trade-offs are. That's followed by the implication round, where participants prototype potential designs for communicating or mediating the implications of the anticipated threats. And then finally, in the action round, the groups use the finished card deck and the implication designs to play a role playing game where groups try to pose a potential threat and the paired team tries to use the design artifact to counter it. And a lot of our research was trying to figure out how to make this game work so that people could understand it so you didn't need a lot of uh, facilitator effort to make it happen. And you know, things we learned, for example, the game, when it was more of an, uh, uh, a game where they were trying to beat each other, people did, some people really didn't like it, so it became much more of a cooperative game over time. So here's some of the many artifacts that come out of the workshops. So at left, that's an uncertainty communicator. The idea here was to surface how uncertain a system was about the AI inference it was making. In the center is an anonymity bracelet that can anonymize the wearer's collected information. Again, these are not necessarily products, but artifacts are what I might term experience prototypes that could then be used by a professional design team to spark, spark further design. So just last month, we applied the same technique in a workshop with 13 older adults in San Francisco to explore new speech-based AI technologies that one of my postdocs is working on. And so we had three groups of participants and they had intersectional identities. So all of these folks are marginalized in some ways in addition to age, um, about half were LGBTQ, many had disabilities, blind wheelchair users or immunocompromised, and many were of different races. And so we started with a technology scenario. Imagine having a device that can speak to you at the same way a human can, and it's been programmed by your doctor to ask questions related to your health and well being, and it learns as much as it can about you and provides that information to your doctor so they can adapt your care. It also makes recommendations personalized to your needs and serves as a companion, actively listening to anything you want to tell it. So that was the scenario that the 
workshops started with so they understood what we were designing around. And then they spent hours going through this game to poke at some of the issues here as well as to design things about it. And so I'm just gonna give you some of the th examples of some things they designed. So um, at left uh, is a design that was really focused on being able to show and control different levels of accessibility to that health data. So the person wrote something about saying the main doctor could have some things on the screen, a nurse would also have accessibility, and then the other one would be like the security person in your building. They'd have a different level of interaction. And family and friends, like, and all your senior friends or your junior club or whatever, would have a variable level of security. So they were trying to think about how they could control the access to the information. This one at right, uh, or at the bottom right, said mine would be controlled, I guess you would say, by the individual themselves. And it would be categories of professional services and tech, and the individual would be able to move these around in real time when things change. This one I thought was interesting. This is a device you hang around your neck. If there's a problem, then you can press the buttons. Blue button if you're panicking. You can press the blue button, it will regulate your breathing. Relax, calm you down. Red, stop everything. Yellow, resume life. And then the last one, detecting device in the doorway so a caregiver that might be taking advantage of you can be caught. Doorway device detects how much money you have in case a caregiver steals money. So if a caregiver leaves with more money than they came with, it will also stop them. Also detects chips on your credit card to see how many credit cards you enter and left with. Again, these aren't designs, but our starting points for design they're a way to get at what are the real problems that these older adults were seeing with these types of technologies and things going on in their lives that they wanted to see new designs of technology to deal with. We, I wouldn't say their designs are the thing you really want to build, but those are meant to motivate the design team to lead them to ideas that might actually uh, be able to, to find those problems and solve them in a way that other design techniques might not surface. So if we use this human-centered AI analysis that I introduced at the beginning at all three levels in the hybrid physical digital spaces case, it may look something like this. So at the user-centered level, we work with and design with building residents, the companies that lease the space, building managers and building owners. At the community-centered level, we should work with anyone who might come into a building or even the neighbors or the taco guy is what I'm always saying we need. And then at the society-centered level, we need to analyze carefully how this system might impact many different groups. And we started to get at this with this older adult group, but in particular, people with disabilities or other marginalized identities that may, may, may not wish to disclose to others. And so it also raises this general question of privilege in society. Who has access to these fancy health-shaping buildings and who does not? And what happens if these buildings are used for workplace surveillance? So far, we've worked mainly focused on these lower portions of those three levels of analysis, but the questions that I've raised at the society-centered level imply this analysis must analyze questions of power, which is often left out of technology research. As engineers, when we talk about power, we usually mean like battery power and energy and heat and things like this. No, but in the social sciences, we talk about power in a lot of the research. And if the decision makers decide to prioritize the user-centered design for managers over the community-centered design for the workers, then surveillance state buildings are what will result. So we would need the design to actively avoid it. This recognition of power reminds me of a great talk I saw last year by Ibram X. Kendi, who's the well-known author and MacArthur Award winner. I was at the Rhode Island School of Design um, visiting, and the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, Crystal Williams, asked Dr. Kendi, what can artists and designers do in creating an anti-racist society? And some of his answer, I actually think, applies to some of this human-centered AI. He said, what is missing is an analysis of power. We live in a moment when different identity groups are advocating for their rights, their power, their presence, and pushing back. What is missing are the bridges of solidarity. We need to constantly be building those bridges. Historically, you know, has built those bridges, artists and designers. And so I believe that as designers, we need to take on this analysis of design at the three levels I've advanced, advocated the user, community, and society, so we can properly identify and take on power, and so we can build those bridges. And I think in this AI sense, we need to understand where is the power in deciding what these systems are gonna do to us as a society, and how do we make sure that we, the public, have some say in what, how they're shaped, rather than just being used. So if you wanna know more about 
what we're thinking about at Stanford HAI or learn more about foundation models, we actually have some accessible briefs that were written for a non-technical audience to understand, so there's not a lot of math and other crazy notations. So if you're interested, you can look at these. Um, and what I want you to take away from this introduction is there are many great applications that we can use to help people be, use AI to help people be better at their tasks. So to augment them, to be better learners, better designers, or take better care of their body. And many of these projects we fund through HAI here at Stanford. So there's a lot going on in these areas. But the key is to keep users, communities, and society's needs at the center of these smart interface designs. And it's critical that we design at these three levels. Today, I'd say we, you're seeing research here. We're in the early days of finding the right design processes to practice truly human-centered AI. Um, but for those out there who are designing these things, you can start simply with communities beyond your direct user population, and you'll create systems that are more likely to have a positive societal impact. Thank you.